Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. Holiday time brings about fantasy of idyllic cozy nights by the fire and being read to by loving adults. Beloved author Tommy De Paola has written 200 such books. Correspondent Lucia Grillo meets up with the Canta Story of Sorts at BAM in Brooklyn. The art of cinema can be many things, among which a documenting tool that brings us to another place, time, and culture. Filmmaker and critic Mario Sesti in New York for MoMA's Retrospective gives us insight into the works of Antonio Pietrangeli with a nod to MoMA's simultaneous tribute to Rai Cinema, featuring the latest film by Matteo Garrone, Tale of Tales, a loose interpretation of the celebrated fables of Giambattista Basile. Who are the new Italian Americans? Italics continues its investigation on the surge of young professional Italians moving to New York City in an interview with Alessandro Parello, actor, filmmaker, and founder of West 46 Magazine. Tommy De Paola has delighted us with his children's books since 1965. Not just a few which detail his Italian-American upbringing with titles like Watch Out for the Chicken Feet in Your Soup and The Beloved Strega Nona. Marking the 40th anniversary of the legendary Calabrian grandmother in print, Mr. De Paola met up with Lucia Grillo at BAM where he read to an enthusiastic audience, equal parts children and adult fans. You know, in Streganona, I have that Streganona could do magic things. And one of the things she could do was to cure a headache. And my Italian grandmother, I called her Nana Fall River, because that's where she lived. <laughs> I was sat there very quietly in the kitchen. They had a line of ladies out the door, and they'd come and they'd sit down, they'd talk in Italian. She'd pour the olive oil in this bowl of water, say the prayer, and her headaches were cured. So. I knew I was dealing with something important in there. How are you? I've loved you since I was 10. Oh. And now these are my, my son's favorite books. Oh, great. So he's got your name. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, indeed. Now, you've written several hundred and illustrated mm -hmm. several hundred mm -hmm. children's books. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm just going through the titles <laughs> in my head. No, yes. <laughs> my first question is, you know, someone who is so important in children's literature. Oh, thank you. Oh, God. Um, what was your childhood like? I had really a pretty wonderful childhood. Um, I didn't think it was wonderful at the time, <laughs> I, but, but I, I, I did. I did. Um, I was very lucky. I told my family in general when I was only four mm -hmm. that when I grew up, I was going to be an artist. I was going to write stories and draw pictures for books, and I was going to sing and tap dance on the stage. And, and I can say that at 81, I've been paid for all the <laughs> above, you know, or below. Uh, but the interesting thing is my immediate family, my mother, my father, I'm half Irish and half Italian. Uh -huh. And um, the Italian relatives, the Irish relatives, they all took me seriously. Yeah. So uh, one year, when the war, Second World War was over, um, and things were available again. I, I came down for Christmas morning, I was around 11, all art supplies. I mean, everything. There was an oil paint set, paper, pens, I mean, you name it. And then my mother and father said to me, you need a studio. And they gave me half the attic as my studio. Stego Nona, why do you think it's your most well-known book? Uh, you know, when I did it, Lucia, it was a one-off book. It wasn't planning to be a series or anything like that. I think it's become an important book because, well, first of all, she's a charming character, and I'm even amazed by her. And she strikes a chord in everyone. You know, you don't have to be Italian to love Streganona. And um, I tell people, I tell children especially, and I mean it, I tell them two things about her. that. When she, ever ha when she has a story to tell, she kind of whispers in my ear mm -hmm. and tells me the story. Uh, you know, it's part of my imagination, of course, but I think she's quintessential of so many aspects of um, the old world, um, you know, fairy tale and folk tale, 
Uh, she's a wise woman, but she's a little magic in her. She's a white witch, of course. Mm -hmm. But I just think she strikes a chord. And then, of course, the, the story, which is based on a root tale that the same tale, the porridge pot story, Sorcerer's Apprentice, mm -hmm. Why the Sea is Salt, the Rice. It's, you know, it just is so funny that, and Big Anthony is, you know, she couldn't be Stregadona without Big Anthony and Bombalona. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just very lucky, very fortunate. But I think that the secret for me is that I paid attention to that part of my imagination. And it wasn't easy. I, was, I got flack in the 70s you know, from my editor. Oh, she's too ethnic, you know? And I said, tough. Good, thank you. Yeah, no. And I got a letter from a librarian. You'll love this. She said, how dare you disguise my Polish grandmother as an Italian? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, you know, th this whole country was built on ethnic groups coming together. And we've forgotten all of that now. And we have to, we have to cherish that ethnicity because it makes us who we are, you know? And I, I've just been lucky. I, I really was blessed to have this come into my head and, and create the character. And of course now she's, she's grown way beyond me, frankly. <laughs> I'm in awe of her. <laughs> the one thing you must never do, said Streganona, is touch the pasta pot. It is very valuable, and I don't let anyone touch it. Oh, oh yes, see, said Big Anthony. And so the days went by. Big Anthony did his work, and Streganona met with the people who came to see her for headaches and husbands and warts. And Big Anthony had a nice bed to sleep in next to the goat shed, and he had food to eat. One evening, when Stregan, Big Anthony was milking the goat, he heard Streganona singing. And peeking in the window, he saw Streganona standing over the pasta pot. And she sang. Bubble, bubble, pasta pot. Boil me some pasta, nice and hot. I'm hungry and it's time to sup. Boil enough pasta to fill me up. And the pasta pot bubbled and boiled and was suddenly filled with steaming hot pasta. Then Streganona sang, Enough, enough, my pasta pot. I have my pasta nice and hot. So simmer down, my pot of clay, until I'm hungry another day. <gasps> How wonderful, said Big Anthony. That's a magic pot for sure. And Streganona called Big Anthony in for supper. But too bad for Big Anthony, because he didn't get to see Streganona blow three kisses. To the magic pasta pot. Mm, one, two, three! The stories take place in Calabria. Yes, yes. Now tell us why that is. That's because my, my Italian relatives came from Calabria. Mm -hmm. And Calabria, just like Sicily, is this whole melting pot of that early you know, civilization. You know, Etruscan, you know, African, um, Greek. And you know, you, I, I really remember, now, when my grandparents came, and my grandfather died, when my, my Italian grandfather died, when my father was very young, when he was 12, so I never knew him. But um, as I got older, and maybe in my 20s, et cetera, and became interested in food and culture, you know, um, I realized that a lot of um, my grandmother's cooking had echoes of Greek cooking in it. You know, the mint, she used a lot of mint. Northern Italy, they don't use any mint. You know, basil, she used tons of mint and basil. And those two herbs together create this third taste, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of my own yeah. nonna's cooking. And yeah. I would, would watch my Italian grandmother. She had this 
Oh, it, it's like this floor. Her little yard was like this floor. But she'd take this old rusty spoon and a little tomato can filled with water, and she'd dig a little hole, and there'd be these spindly tomato plants, and she'd spoon out the water on the plants. And then, you know, they, they produced tomatoes like this. And then when she canned, I, I used to love being around her. And of course, she made Easter bread every Easter. You show that in one of your books. Yeah, yes, and watch out for the chicken feet in your soup. <laughs> now talk about watch out for chicken feet in your soup. Oh yeah, that, I did that way before Streganona. That was an early book. And uh, there's a couple of things about that book. First of all, I wanted to sort of honor my Italian grandmother, you know, because she, she did. She talked funny, and she, her house, she was always cooking, and she had all these funny things in the house. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. And so Joey brings Eugene to his house to meet his grandmother, warns him, and watch, and watch out, because watch out for the chicken feet in your soup, because my grandmother did put the feet and the neck, you know, in the soup, and of course, my aunts would chew on them, you know, the two aunts would fight, over, three aunts would fight over the two chicken. As a child, can you imagine that going to school? Well, my aunts fought over the chicken feet in the soup and everyone's looking like you. <laughs> but I realized that that's how we learn about other cultures, isn't it? All those stories. And, and I did that book just in dialogue. And I used sort of broken English for the grandmother. And my editor was very frightened. Well, that book was done way before Streganon. It's still in print. You use, there's a, you use a lot of Italian words in your books. Oh, well, yeah, well, that was a no-brainer. Uh, but I just got so in, embraced, started to embrace the whole culture and the folklore. Knowing other cultures actually brings us together as human beings, right? Because mm. there's no more unknown, like it becomes more familiar. It's all about the human condition yeah. and the human needs and the human love. And, uh, and, you know, forget the language, forget the clothing. It's all basically the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that this recent, this whole recent thing, it, it, you know, uh, it, it, this is a country of immigrants. It started with the pilgrims. And we forget that, you know? And uh, um, we just have to stop this foolishness mm -hmm. and just celebrate, the, the, you know, that we have. I, it, I think this went, this, um, this fall, watching the tremendous uh, influx of of immigrants in Europe, you know, these people are not, they're trying to have a life. They, they're trying to have things that, um, you know, th that everybody wants. And, um, and there's a Buddhist thought that says that, you know, there are no th such things as enemies. We are all, we all want the same thing. We all want to be happy and not to suffer. Mm -hmm. And if only we could just realize that we wouldn't get into this you know, you versus me, and you go over there, and you're, you know, you're no good because you don't speak the language, and, and, you know, it's um, I think that we, I think it behoves us, who are, children of immigrants, or uh, you know, or um, we're all immigrants in this country, mm -hmm. to kind of look deeply, and to see what contributions the immigrant has made. You talk a lot about diversity. Well, even. I, I, think that, I think that really hit me in art school when I went to Pratt Institute in the 50s. And suddenly there I was with all kinds of wonderful people. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but the town I grew up in, in Connecticut, we had all kinds of different, different kids in the school. We had some African Americans, some Chinese Americans, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, Russian, Polish, Italian, French, you know. Uh, and we all got along, and the wonderful thing, I knew Maurice Sendak, and he told me personally that his best friend was a little girl named Rosie, and he did the book Really Rosie about her. And he thought that they were happy Jews. And he was going to have his bar mitzvah, so he prayed that his father would turn into a happy Jew. Well, he found out that Rosie and her family were Italians. <laughs> <laughs> But he said, you know, everybody in, in Brooklyn where he grew up, every, in the neighborhood of the ghetto neighborhood, everybody looked the same. The mothers all looked the same, you know. <laughs> Didn't matter whether they were Italian, Jewish, Polish, Irish, whatever. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, you know, um, it, it all starts with fear, mm -hmm. fear of the other, mm -hmm. fear of the other. I mean, just look at any discrimination in the world and even today. It's always fear of the other, yeah. you know. Um, and once we realize that we're all part of the same fabric, yeah. 
that we can, and that, that's why I think that um, I've been very proud, frankly, that, uh, that somebody like Streganona captures imagination. Yeah. In Not Upstairs, mm -hmm. Not a Downstairs, you address a child's experience with death. Yes, yes. How do we address <coughs> death with children so it's not a devastating okay. thing? Okay, Nana Upstairs, Nana Downstairs is actually my, out of all the books I've done, is still my favorite. And it's because it's the first time I was really brave enough to tell a totally true story. Mm -hmm. My best friend at four years old was my Irish great-grandmother. Her name was Honora O'Rourke, and she was bedridden, so she became Nana upstairs. And my Irish grandmother, grandmother was downstairs by the big stove all the time, so she became Nana downstairs. And every Sunday we would go down to their house, and I'd run up the back stairs, so everything in that book is totally real. And when she died, um, suddenly my, my best friend, you know, she'd, sit, she'd, she'd tell me stories. She, she, was, she was probably senile, but not to me. Um, and uh, my brother was scared of her because she was thin and crone looking, but I wasn't. I thought she was beautiful. Right. And um, I'd watch my grandmother brush her hair and, you know, turn, you know then my grandmother would, brush her hair and make the cow's tail, you know, wrap oh. it around. And so I was very intimately involved in this whole sort of care business. And, you know, there's some very funny, actual true stories about it. But when she died, I remember running up the stairs and they had already taken the body to the funeral home and the bed was pulled back and, it, and it, the room was like light. And when I did that illustration, I had this catharsis of, you know, and Years later, we did it as a full color book, and the same thing happened. You know, oh, mm -hmm. But I said to my mother, won't I ever, what's, what's died mean? And my mother actually said to me, died means you'll never see her again. And I said, I'll never see her again. My mother said, well, you will in your memory. Whenever you think about her, she'll come back. So I, to be perfectly honest with you, I have never been afraid of death. Because to me, it's not necessarily an end, it's a beginning. Of course, you miss the person, but they're there. And now I've immor immortalized the two of them, yeah. And everything in that book is true, including the shooting stars. I have this mystical life. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're so fortunate that you share with us. Oh, listen, I have to. I have a need. Thank you. And thank you for reading all those things. Oh. Noted film critic, esteemed filmmaker, and founder of the prestigious and star-studded Roma Cinema Fest, now in its 10th year, Mario Sesti was in New York for the opening of two recent events at the Museum of Modern Art. Antonio Pietrangeli, a retrospective, and Italian film, 21st century style, a tribute to Rai Cinema. Mr. Sesti met with Lucia Grillo at the museum to talk about the cultural, creative, and social importance of Pietrangeli's work, and that of Italian cinema, both historic and contemporary. Mario, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about these two um, simultaneous Italian cinema events here at MoMA. The retrospective of uh, Antonio Petrangeli's film mm -hmm. and the meeting and the presentation of the Matteo Garone's film. Mm -hmm. Antonio Petrangeli is a very important author of the Italian cinema uh, of the 40s and uh, of the 50s. His point of view was uh, absolutely modern and non-conventional mm -hmm. because uh, mostly his films spoke about the strange position of the woman in uh, the modern society and uh, above all in Italian landscape. In his films, the touch of desire is so sensual. Mm. The way he looks to the body of the women. The idea is to show how the male side is so profoundly touched by the representation of the women. Women are so much desired and so much abandoned, despised, and she's by something like 
a content because no one wants to do with them unless that for sexual matters. Pietrangeli uses the female uh, matter, the female side of the world, to um, focus on the uh, contradiction and the, um, uh, the, uh, the lack of justice between the relation of people in general. Mm. Uh, Pietrangeli was um, a great uh, erudite, a great translator from French literature. He was able to uh, to draw uh, upon the modern uh, novels, the modern sensibility <laughs> of the literature. It's kind of editing, for instance. It, it's very modern. He uses a, a sort of fragmented discontinuity in the storytelling, which is not so common in Italian cinema of the period, for, uh, for instance. His camera work was very modern, like uh, that one of the author of the novel Vague of that period. At the same time, he was very able in working in a very popular genre, like comedy. What touches uh, in a deep way the uh, audience is the kind of tenderness he is able to share with the, with the spectator. This kind of a character who was very modern, at, at the same time very vulnerable, mm -hmm. very sweet, in a way very childish, yeah. with no protection in meeting the outer world. The kind of knowledge she has is more profound, is more adult mm -hmm. than uh, one of the male characters that she meets during the film. Mm -hmm. The male audience could be quite embarrassed by the idea to share the same desire of the male characters mm -hmm. and to be identified with this kind of people, which were not good people right. at all. Right. Matteo Garrone, one of the, my favorite uh, contemporary Italian directors, mm -hmm. speaking about his last movie, uh, which was selected by the Film Festival of Cannes, mm -hmm. it's important to get the literature of the past, even the literature of the Middle Age, to use it uh, to tell of the present. Because mm -hmm. when you are going to see Il racconto dei racconti, you will discover that the uh, main theme is the same of Pietrangeli. Because the uh, more touching uh, characters, the more sorrow you can feel in the movies are uh, very closely related with the destiny of the women in that kind of world. For example, it's a, one of the better movies I ever seen in the last years about uh, the domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Even if uh, uh, it's a film which took place uh, so many centuries ago. Mm -hmm. sure. But it's able to speak about this kind of uh, vulnerability of the women the violence against the women, the oppression, uh, the, uh, the, the lacking of justice. Mm -hmm. It's a very touching film from this kind of point of view. And this is the book that you put together as a catalog, let's say, for this retrospective. Yes. And people can get this on Amazon and find out more about this amazing filmmaker and your great writing and, and that of others on the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Watch Lucia Grillo's full interview with Mario Sesti on Italics TV. In an ongoing series, Italics has interviewed young newcomers from Italy to the Big Apple. Alessandro Parrello is our latest addition. Let's go to Lucia Grillo. Young, educated, talented artists and professionals are flocking to our city and boroughs. Alessandro Parello, actor, producer, and founder of West 46 Magazine, is one of them. Alessandro, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So tell us about your journey from being an actor in Italy to now. 
18 years old, I started to doing uh, voices and imitations of the teachers and uh, famous people. Mm -hmm. And dialects also, and then I started to, uh, you know, get, you know, involved into uh, acting stuff at the beginning with small, little characters, Elisa di Rivombrosa, which is a popular Italian mm. TV series, and then little by little, you know, I, I I decided I wanted to do this one for life, and then because I love it so much, and it's not like uh, a job for me; it's a passion that you have inside, and mm. you know, to what you wanted to share with other people. I decided to move to New York because I made an interview from this series mm. and I was saying to the, uh, to the journalist, I'm going to Los Angeles actually. When I got the paper, the title was Alessandro Parrello is going to New York. You know what I did? Actually, I changed the ticket <laughs> from Los Angeles <laughs> to New York and that was March 7, 2007. The magazine, you started in March of this year, yes. and already you have thousands of readers yes. in several different countries. When I have this idea of the magazine, I had an accident, bad accident, and I was in a cast with my right arm, uh -huh. and I was kind of depressed at home, and then I say, I have to come up with something, I have to do, I have to use this time, and I remember one day I put together, and I came up with this idea of my love for my country, from Italy, for Italy, my love for United States and for New York in particular, mm -hmm. and I put those two things together. So I called my graphic designer, we developed a website, uh -huh. I called one journalist in Rome, which is very, uh, she's very young, a very talented journalist, and then we just started with the concept and then with the first interviews, and then we, we developed little by little, and then we already dealing and interviewing top Italian movie stars, uh, singers, um, publishers, uh, novelists. Earlier this month, we interviewed Willem Dafoe and Matt Dillon, which we also they they greet the magazine. They say hello to the, our readers, <laughs> and I was very you know uh, proud of this because when you have a top movie uh, movie star, American mm -hmm. ones, that you know is talking to your readers, to something that you created, it's very emotional. So tell us about your film company. The film company is a small independent company. I uh, started this company four years ago in Rome. We produced a Western, and then we produced a web series for Fox Italy, mm. which is called The Innocent Bastard, and I was playing The Innocent Bastard, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. then I, we produced a few short movies, and we work also for other companies. We do executive for like documentaries and uh -huh. stuff. The Western, uh, it's something that it's unbelievable because it's the most clicked video on Rai Cinema channel and Condé yeah. Nast Live. Yeah. And basically, we came out on the, on the newspapers in Italy as the return of Spaghetti Western, Fantastic. of Italian Westerns, Fantastic. which is good, actually. Yeah. And we hope to sell this product. Uh, worldwide because we shot in English. Oh, fantastic. I was just going to ask yes, you. Yes, mostly so. of my productions, I, I want to try to um, shot in English when it's possible. I think that's the key. You know, if we shot a product that we can sell internationally, we have more audience. The same spirit of the magazine. Right. The magazine is main, the main language is English, and that's why I have readers from many, many countries. You recently did something called Rai Cinema Ricette. This is a very beautiful TV show, and basically this is the concept. We have 21 actors, and in each episode, we tell a story about the recipe that we love the most, and then there is a story behind, like in, in connected to movies. Mm -hmm. We give instructions, and there is the, the important chef, which is doing, as we, we describe, our recipe, uh -huh. and we have to say if he did a good job or not. <laughs> They're very, very, very funny, actually. Okay. The what recipe did you make? I did the carbonara. I'm from Rome, <laughs> so I did the carbonara. Rigatoni alla carbonara. <laughs> so what are your plans for the new year. The what plan is to uh, do what I love to do and try to be happy because mm -hmm. to me it's to be happy with yourself and then if you do something that you like at least once a day for like half an hour a day you can be happy with yourself. You have to feed yourself with some good energy. That's it. We'll leave our viewers with that. Yes. And we wish you the best in the new year. Thank you. And we'll see you the in 2000. You. Thank you. Yes. We'll see you in 2016. Absolutely. We bid you buon anno nuovo. Happy New Year. With this montage of holiday cheer midtown Manhattan. With a touch of Italy. We'll see you in 2016 with our next episode airing January 27th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.